There is perhaps no other entity in horror literature that has been so deeply enshrined in the rich flowing tapestry of the culture and the people than that of the Wendigo. You see, whether its depiction differs from source to source, be it in early 17th century literature or more recently in television, graphic literature and visual media, the exact transformation of this deeply complex and important creature can be traced through time like the rings of an ancient redwood. The thing is though, as this lore has more recently established itself firmly in horror fiction as a whole, the legend of the Wendigo is as ancient and ever changing still. But to understand it, we first have to peel back the layers of history in an attempt to search for its roots. So, let's see what we can dig up. Hello horror fans, what's going on? And once again, welcome back to the scariest channel on YouTube, Top 5 Scary Videos. As per usual, I'll be your horror host, Jack Finches. Today, we return to the lore explored and take a look at the Wendigo. Roll the clip. What was that? It's just a loon. Ah, sorry there pal, but it is not a loon. For the curious amongst you, that clip was from 2019's Pet Cemetery, based upon Stephen King's 1983 novel of the same name, which, for those of you that have read it, will know that it's one of King's most despairing of tales, and also, that movie got quite a bit of stick, but hey, I thought it was pretty good. Also, interestingly enough, King's adaptation decided to flesh out the age-old tale of the ancient burial ground of legend by pairing it with the spirit of the Wendigo, which is telling to modern fiction's interpretation of the Wendigo myth, but as we're about to find out, there is far more to it than an antler-bound revenant of the dead. To first understand a creature or a concept, perhaps our first port of call should be the etymology behind it. The definition of the term Wendigo is a key part of the oral traditions of the indigenous people people of North America. And well, that's where we first find our first problem, because as we will quickly find, there are many different ways to portray the word Wendigo. In the Ojibwe language, it is the Wendigo. In the language of the Algonquin people, it is Wajigo. In the Cree, it is the Wicked Tau. And in the Proto-Algonquin of the Algi, it is We Nekato Wa, which most likely translated to Owl in their original language. And this is where it is difficult to pinpoint the exact origin of the concept, or whether there even was an origin point. And the Wendigo instead emerged into the psyche of the indigenous people of North America through a shared sense of moral obligation, or even stranger still, the same shared experiences. That though is pure speculation, but interestingly enough, there is a similar word, the Wachuge, that depicts a similar being that appears in the legends of the Athabascan people of the northwest Pacific coast. You see, much like the Wendigo, the Wachuge is a man-eating creature that devours flesh as a curse and eternal punishment. But interestingly, the Wachuge of legend is instead inexplicably tied to the creation mythos of a specific group of Athabascan people, the Danija, which roughly translate to those who who live among the beaver, who believe that in their mythology, the Wachugate was a person who would become possessed or overwhelmed by the power of one of the ancient giant spirit animals that formed the basis of their oral tradition. In most instances, the Wachugate is depicted as a creature formed of ice and can only be killed by being thrown into a campfire and kept there overnight until it has melted. In some instances, however, this creature is even depicted as having wings, a rare occurrence in the traditions of North American legend and a symbol of great importance. Whichever depiction of the Wendigo myth we take though, one thing is for certain. In the traditional belief systems of the Ojibwe, the Saltu, the Cree, the Naskapi, the Innu, and many other Algonquin speaking peoples of North America, the Wendigo is far more than just a cautionary tale told to children over a campfire. It is an integral part of their complex belief system, and in most cases it served as a taboo reinforcement, both a reminder and a warning of the hardships faced through winter. No matter which depiction of the myth we pull apart, in each of them, the Wendigo is seen as the embodiment of gluttony and greed, particularly in relation to the unbreakable taboo of cannibalism. It is a cultural cornerstone, a warning sign of excess in consumption, and the creature that would later form these warning signs would become the embodiment of that. Now that is not to say that the depiction of the Wendigo was always the same. In some cases, particularly in regard to Ojibwe and Cree lore, the Wendigo was often described as a giant creature, many, many times larger than a human being, a differing characteristic that was absent from other Wendigo myths of Algonquian culture. In these legends, whenever a Wendigo would consume another person, it would grow larger in proportion to the meal it had just eaten, preventing it from ever sating its own hunger. It always wanted more, never sated or content with its quarry. That's an important lesson for all of us to learn, I think. 
But still, this led to the garish and oftentimes terrifying description of this creature that would later become the driving force behind its evolution from the 20th century onwards, particularly when we analyse its depiction in modern horror fiction. As Basil H. Johnson, an Ojibwe teacher and scholar from Ontario, described in his 1995 book The Manitou's The Spirit World of the Ojibwe, the Wendigo was gone to the point of emaciation, its desiccated skin pulled tightly over its bones. With its bones pushing out against its skin, its complexion the ash grey of death, and its eyes pushed back deep into their sockets, the Wendigo looked like a gaunt skeleton recently disinterred from the grave. What lips it had were tattered and bloody, unclean and suffering from suppuration of the flesh. The Wendigo gave off a strange and eerie odour of decay and decomposition of death and corruption. And this is where the modern depiction of the Wendigo gained traction as an entity of horror fiction. The Wendigo is terrifying, a humanoid supernatural creature that exemplified an eternal hunger. And as European settlers made their way through North America and the colonial period of the continent began to tighten its grip around this ancient culture, the modern interpretation of the Wendigo was born. And not only that, but as science and psychology came face to face with ancient oral traditions, the exact concept of the Wendigo's cultural purpose became something else entirely. Wendigo psychosis. A historical phenomenon that is perhaps the reason why the Wendigo myth was so successful in later North American literature. In 1661, as a chronicler and missionary for the Jesuit relations made their way through North America, they came across the first documented account of Wendigo psychosis as a result of a reported case of desperation and cannibalism. As he explained, the men that he came across were afflicted with neither lunacy, hypochondria, nor frenzy, but a combination of all of these species of disease, which affects their imaginations and causes them a more than canine hunger. This makes them so ravenous for human flesh that they pounce upon women, children, and even upon men, like veritable werewolves, and devour them voraciously without being able to appease or glut their appetite, ever seeking fresh prey, and the more greedily, the more they eat. Whatever the interpretation of this report, it was an important moment in the later cultural significance of the Wendigo, particularly with its relation as a genuine concern for the rough and often inhospitable periods in colonial North American history. Now, the Wendigo was far more than just a creature in a far off land, but instead a very real hardship faced in winter as the inexperienced fur trappers and settlers pushed further into the New World, hearing tales from the indigenous peoples of the land who had grew to fear it over many, many generations. However, one of the more famous cases of Wendigo psychosis came several hundred years later with the tale of a Plains Cree trapper named Swift Runner. During the harsh winter of 1878, Swift Runner and his family were stranded and starving in the wilderness of Saskatchewan. Soon, despite being 25 miles away from the emergency food cache of the Hudson's Bay Company, Swift Runner's eldest son perished, and shortly afterward, Swift Runner allegedly butchered and ate his wife and five remaining children. The case was both strange and shocking, and given that the Plains Cree trapper resorted to cannibalism in such close proximity to the emergency cache, it was later revealed that Swift Runner's actions were not the case of pure cannibalism as a dark and last resort to starvation, but rather of a man afflicted by Wendigo psychosis. And here was the inspiration for the first and very important fictional interpretation of the Wendigo myth, with a short story written by Algernon Blackwood, a tale written in the year 1910 simply titled The Wendigo, the first mainstream horror depiction of its kind. In the story, Blackwood tells a tale of two Scotsmen on a moose hunting trip in the wilderness of Rat Portage in northwest Ontario. They are joined on their trip by two guides, a man named Hank Davis and the French Canuck Joseph Defago, alongside their native cook, a man named Punk. Although this tale is a very tame brush with the Wendigo myth of legend compared to most modern incarnations, it instead employed the first depiction of the Wendigo not just as a grotesque entity, but instead as a doppelganger which could take on the guise of a human being. Perhaps the most important convention of this story though is with the wisdom of the native character, Punk, who recognises all of the signs of the Wendigo and immediately gets the hell out of camp. Whatever its importance to the mainstream horror depiction of the Wendigo, Algernon Blackwood's story planted the seed of an idea in many other horror writers of the time. It would influence authors such as Howard Phillips Lovecraft and Grace Isabel Colburn, and most importantly, August de Leth, who would use the concept of the Wendigo in his story, The Thing That Walked on the Wind, and later with his Cthulhu mythos entity, Ithacua, which some of you may be familiar with. 
Hidden, it's a giant Wendigo-looking ice revenant that roams the Arctic wastes. Sound familiar? Yeah. It would also go on to inspire an early short story of Thomas Pynchon's titled Mortality and Mercy in Vienna, first published in 1959. Here it focused on a character developing Wendigo psychosis and his development then into a psychotic serial killer. That in itself would later inspire several movies such as 1999's Ravenous as well as several TV series such as Charmed and more recently Hannibal. Perhaps the most iconic of the modern Wendigo though is with Stephen King's version of the entity. As we briefly explained in our opening clip, it would inspire a key character in King's 1983 novel Pet Cemetery, where the personification of evil in an ancient burial ground of the Mi'kmaq people was an ugly grinning creature with yellow grey eyes, its ears replaced by ram's horns and its tongue pointed, decaying and yellowed. Although not as profound as it is now, at the time King's interpretation of the Wendigo, which in turn was an interpretation of the 19th century colonial legends coming from North America, set the template for the Wendigo's later portrayal in popular horror culture, where for the most part it completely replaced the Native American lore that had long formed the importance of the Wendigo. In 2012 though, Chippewa author Louise Erdich had a thing or two to say about that with her novel The Roundhouse, setting the precedent for the new reinterpretation of the Wendigo myth. And here is where our path splits, because the Wendigo in many ways explains the transformation of one land to the other. For thousands of years the Wendigo served as a cultural barometer for the Algonquin people, an ever adapting tale that form the importance of cooperation, of restraint, of sustainability and the dangers that came with forsaking those virtues. It painted the monster that we all ran the risk of becoming if we indulged too much in the act of greed. You see, as colonial North America expanded into these ancient territories and these settlers shifted away from the many European folk tales that had formed the basis of their society, new ones were forged, fragments of a culture that had long existed before them as they clambered to produce some sort of an identity. Whilst this identity has been interpreted in many differing ways, perhaps in most cases to their detriment, the essence behind the myth of the Wendigo has always remained the same. Be it man or monster, we all choose which side we fall on. Well there we have it horror fans, our dive into the rich mythos of the Wendigo myth and believe me there is far far more to this incredibly important cultural concept than just what I've attempted to explain here. So if it's piqued your interest in any way, make sure to enjoy the legend for yourself. And there we have it, our fourth episode of The Lore Explored. And you know what? I'm absolutely loving this series so far, but why don't you let us know what you're thinking down in the comment section below and let us know if you have any suggestions for future videos. Please, I'd like to hear them. On that note, unfortunately, that's all we've got time for in today's video. Cheers for sticking around all the way until the end. If you were a fan of this video or just top five scary videos in general, then please be a dear and hit that thumbs up button as well as that subscribe bell. And I'll be seeing you in the next one. As per usual, I've been your horror host, Jack Finch. You'll be watching top five scary videos. And until next time, you take it easy.